the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Methodology as Political Process by Lainey Lennox. As an anarchist researcher, my work is inherently political. The methodological frameworks I employ are tools of this political action. In another paper, Temporal Impermanence and Liberation in Everyday Action, I talk extensively about anarchism as this everyday political action. By our individual choices and these actions, we can begin to embody our imagined futures in the here and now. I am an anarchist researcher. Therefore, a significant aspect of my everyday life and actions is in choosing how to conduct academic research. The way in which I conduct this research should reflect my hoped-for future. As such, the methodological ethos used in my doctoral work is based on practicing a kind of anarchist ethnography. This anarchist ethnography allows for the creation of research that deconstructs hierarchical prioritization of knowledge and values process divorced from the need to reach positivistic conclusions. Through prioritizing process, this type of ethnography adopts a sense of slowness through dialogue-style interviews, participant feedback, and walking autoethnography. This slow ethnographic practice allows for more pluralistic and nuanced understandings that contribute to a broader tradition of nonlinear practice and understanding decentralization. This is an act of incorporating participatory democratic and anarchic practice into the research process itself. As part of my doctoral fieldwork, I conducted dialogue-style interviews with former political prisoners that were incarcerated in the former East Germany and had since their incarceration participated in memorialization projects related to this prison experience. This type of interview process is based on a nonlinear approach to research. My fieldwork focused on German memorial culture and understanding how engaging with the past within a nonlinear understanding can help us build more inclusive futures by providing a framework for reflection and for considering how the events and structures of the past inform our realities and thus how we imagine and construct our futures. Before beginning my interviews, I attended the Mauerfall Festival, which celebrated the 30th anniversary of the Berlin Wall's opening. The Mauerfall Festival was not trying to establish a singular narrative of events. Different historical sites in the city had temporary museum exhibits, public lectures, oral history exhibits, and a cornucopia of other exhibits designed to allow visitors to engage with the past 30 years of Germany's history. It was too much for one person to attend everything, so as an individual, you had to curate your experience. It was a dynamic memorialization experience that felt like having a conversation with the city. The onus was placed on individuals to engage and build understanding in a dynamic way and to let go of our singular notions of the way history happens and the way we consider the past. This is very similar to the experience I had conducting dialogue interviews with my participants. Engaging with my participants' life stories in this nuanced way really got me to think about how we can think of democracy. Going into these interviews, I wanted to understand how this pluralistic approach to history that you have to adopt when you engage with a singular person's life can tell us about how we can democratize societies more broadly. Jacques Ranzier considers democracy as the widening of the public sphere. So that is the widening of the opportunity for individual citizens and average people to participate in the structures that are impacting their lives. In this understanding, democracy is this overarching governing process. But we can also think about what this democratic understanding can mean if we incorporate it into how we discuss, understand, and engage with the past. 
Chantal Mouffe advocates for a kind of agonistic democracy that institutionalizes dissent. This framework incorporates the participatory nature of Rancière's understanding, but calls for an extension of Mouffe's agonism from an anarchist understanding of consensus groups. Agonism is based on a zero-sum game framework in which two polarized identities, in the act of opposing each other, remain in a potentially perpetual game of tug-of-war. Anarchist consensus groups, on the other hand, are inherently future-focused. At a very basic level, consensus groups function as spaces for group decision-making. However, they are not based on a majority vote decision-making structure. Rather, they are based on dialogue, and rather than being spaces in which conclusive decisions are reached, they are spaces created to create community-based solutions. Rather than entering a consensus group with a particular end in mind, participants work together to create a consensus-based solution. While they do prioritize process over ends, they exist in order to create participatory spaces to design better future societies. In this way, they are simultaneously forward-looking and reflective. This creates a democratic process without end. So we think about democracy as the conversation we're having about how to reach our best possible futures. As soon as we close that conversation, we're closing the opportunity for people to participate, which means that we've really closed the democratic process itself. The dialogue interview process is an application of this democratic way of building knowledge and understanding. The dialogue process differs from a traditional interview space, as well as from the life storytelling interview process in a few key ways. Although I wrote interview questions prior to beginning my fieldwork, I did not force these questions into the interview space. Prior to meeting with participants, I provided an explanation of my research, the themes I was interested in discussing, and an abbreviated list of questions. I found this was enough to structure the conversations without creating an overly structured interview space. Interview length was also dictated by the participant, and I met multiple times with a single participant. I had four participants that I met for multiple sessions, which lasted anywhere between one hour and two days spent together sharing meals and walking around historical sites and cities. Although life storytelling interviews are also non-traditional and semi-structured interview processes, there is a sort of linear assumption that comes with relating the story of one's life. As we tend to think of the temporal space we occupy as having a beginning, a middle, and an end. And importantly, there was really a back and forth sense of dialogue in my interview space. Although my respondents certainly did speak most of the time, they did also ask questions of me. We also discussed political ideas, memorialization, and life in general as it related to these themes. This type of anthropological practice draws heavily from Michael Jackson and Albert Piet's understanding of existential anthropology. Existential anthropology insists on viewing research participants as full and complex individuals rather than just generators of specific data. In my own research, I extend the sense of complexity and wholeness to myself as the researcher. That is, I view myself as a complex, nuanced, and subjective individual rather than an objective observer and analyzer of data. This is built based on feminist standpoint theory and diffractive methodological practice. Feminist standpoint theory argues that all knowledge comes from a certain perspective or standpoint, and it's just that some standpoints are valued over others. Acknowledging this allows for the reflexivity necessary to address blind spots within productions of knowledge, what standpoint theorist Sandra Harding calls strong objectivity. Diffractive methodology, which I draw mostly from Barad and Taguchi, rejects the traditional understanding of reflexivity based on singular individuality. Rather, diffractive methodology understands our perspectives as co-produced and constantly shaped by our external environments and interactions. So diffractive methodology becomes a communal way to conceptualize reflexivity. I apply this diffractive understanding to conceptualize what happened between myself and the research participants in the interview space. Our perspectives were shaped by the dialogue had in that space. Neither of our perspectives were fixed, but rather depended on one another. We didn't come to the interview space to present immutable perspectives. 
Rather, the dialogues were about negotiation and nuance. This tells us more broadly that we don't enter conversations to discover each other's nuance, rather we create it collectively. Therefore, the conversations themselves are transformative. Thus, the more inclusive our conversations around imagining our futures are, the more potential there is for them to be truly transformative. The field of anthropology has both a lot of democratic potential and a difficult past to reckon with. I think this is best illustrated through explaining the role of a type of memorialization used in Germany called stumbling stones. Stumbling stones are the extensive Holocaust memorial project that is located in Germany and also parts of Europe that Germany occupied during the Second World War. The mark where Jews were deported to concentration and death camps. They're a really great example of this sort of everyday reckoning with the past, which is necessary for societal transformation and transformation within the field of anthropology itself. Stumbling stones are located on footpaths, so thus they ask those passing to engage with a difficult part of history during their everyday lives. While they're embodied in the present, they're having to engage with a difficult part of the past. This sort of reckoning with the past of a place is essential to building more inclusive and socially just societies. This type of ethnography can offer an important tool for this kind of societal reflection. For too long, anthropological tradition was based on harmful colonial practices and hierarchies. It was a discipline based on traveling to quote-unquote far-off places to study a quote-unquote other. Instead, we can start to consider ethnography not as the study of the other, but to think of its potential to interrogate our own systems and the problematic colonial histories of those systems. In my own ethnographic doctoral work, I've sought to understand how the collaborative and reflexive practices I'm trying to develop can offer space to meaningfully reflect on divisive pasts. It is my hope that this space for reflection can help shape understandings of how to move forward from conflict and divide and help us understand how to build more radically democratic, transformative, and inclusive futures. This process of imagining in and of itself can be an anarchic act. In discussing participation in political movements, David Graeber argues that once an individual meaningfully starts to consider that actions can be taken to change the direction of our futures, this sort of hope or possibility never completely goes away. That is, once something is imagined, it can't be unimagined. He calls this a transformative outbreak of imagination. It's my hope that this type of ethnographic practice can become a tool for this kind of political imagining of possible futures through engaging with history and the past. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.